Welcome more gamers, my name is Doug with 2 Plus Tough, and today I want to share a story with you that I think that you will like. This story is based on a solo mode version of a role playing game that I thought was super interesting. We're going to talk about it more here at the end, here it is just kind of give you a preview. But I thought that maybe I could hook you with the actual tale first before we dive into the system that lets it happen. So here is my story in a somewhat abbreviated version for you. My party began to groggily wake up in the back of a slave cage caravan. We were crossing some form of desert, some long desolate waste uh, in kind of this orderly fashion with so many others all caged up. Along with, you know, within my party, were four heroes. There was Brash, a rogue-like person who is very much about charisma, and he has a dark past that he is essentially running away from. There's also Akihiro of Chalice, a warrior who basically failed his uh, a sort of test to become the ultimate guardian of his people, and so left in shame to train harder so he can come back and reclaim his mantle as a guardian. There's also Sar Jessica Dane, who is actually of noble descent, set to inherit the kingdom of her father. However, she needs some adventure of her own to be able to really understand the gravity of the choices that she's going to make as a leader. And finally, there is Amelia Pass Dane. This is the half-sister of Sar Jessica, and she was actually outcast along with her mother and has basically been living as a rogue and sort of a druid out in the woods. What brought these four heroes together is a little bit murky at this point, but the thing that unites us is very evident. Our capture, our enslavement. And on the horizon we can see the city of Saltdad. The caravan brings us into the deepest heart of the city. Now, this city is actually incredible. It's actually in decline, but it stood at one point as the most magnificent thing within the desert. The giant iron tower of the king still remains. His glorious arena is sort of falling apart here and there in some places, but it is definitely those two buildings that are the true edifice of this society. Everything else is kind of falling apart, a little bit run down over the long years. We are brought directly to that arena, specifically dumped into slave pits where they are kind of corralled like cattle so that they can die in the arena. Upon entering this pit, one of the characters asked, where's the food come from? We're starving, we've been in this caravan for days. And another slave replies, you'll know it when you see it. At that moment, food drops from the ceiling. There's like a little bit of a trap door and a barely cooked goat just falls to the ground and all of the slaves rush it as if they're trying to just take a little shred of meat just to eat something. It is the most meager sustenance possible. Up from the crowd comes a, a squad of like four very large bullies who are pushing all the other slaves away, trying to claim the meat for themselves. Now at this point we have a choice. We can let them do that, we can try to buddy up with them, or we can push them back. And that's exactly what we decide to do. We shove them away, and they threaten us, but ultimately they do relent. We're able to get some food and find a little bit of hay to kind of lay our heads on and rest for the next day. And after that restless nights of sleep, we're woken up by the guards. All four of my companions and I are ushered out towards the fighting arena. Now, on the way there, a very strange young girl looks at us. She's being used as a slave to go around and pass out food for the guards and things like that. And she looks at us and she whispers, don't use magic. But she never reveals why. So, you know, we kind of take that into consideration. I mean, Amelia Pastain is the only one of us who's a magic wielder, and she agrees, you know, kind of a silent nod to understand what the girl's intent is to kind of give us a friendly warning, but without understanding why. At that point, we are led into the, you know, the area immediately right in front of the arena pit, and we're given some very crude weapons, as long as well as. Sar Jessica gets a shield, which makes sense. She's more used to the more, you know, knightly weapons, the sword and shield. Akihiro takes the maul. He typically uses a double-handed sword weapon, so this, this is probably the best thing for him. And everybody else gets these crude clubs. After a brief in, you know, introduction to the actual fighting pit from a speaker, the king has a seat to watch the games. Several gates open at once, releasing their occupants. All of them are other slave fighters. 
And, you know, we, we all walk out there. We're kind of sussing each other out like, okay, I mean, who's going to move first kind of a thing. And then the group to our left tries to rush us, try to be you know, the, the aggressor and surprise us. And we're able to strike them down. Sar Jessica takes some scraps, but honestly, her shield defended her from the worst of it. She kind of acts like the group's tank, right? Her and Akiro are definitely the most aggressive and melee focused. They understand war and combat on a different level. Now, at this point, we have a choice. We could kind of hang around the edges of the battlefield and try to be dodgy, or we can leap directly into the fray. The group kind of looks at each other, and here's the thing. Brash is a person who understands people, right? He's a charismatic person, not a fighter, but he gets what these games are about, as do Akihiro and Sar Jessica. If you want to survive in an arena, you have to win the crowd. It's not about, it's not enough to just live through this game. If you want to play it and win, you have to get the crowd on your side. And so they decide instead of, you know, kind of dodging around the edges, we're going to leap straight into the hardest of the combat. We take on the strongest, toughest bunch that we could find. And we do get scraped up. Akihiro takes massive damage, but he does still live. But after trading blows for several minutes, we're actually able to take down this group. Now, once the last of their warriors are struck down, the fight ends, and we are named the Pit Champions. And this comes with a little bit of a bonus. We get a better resting space. We get a personal trainer named Chi some good actual food and water, and we're allowed to take a little bit of a reprieve. During this night of, you know, tiny amounts of rest and relaxation for the moment, uh, Brash actually wanders off. He was trying to find the bathroom, and while he's away, he gets pinned to the wall by the gang of slaves from before, the ones that they had pushed away from, you know, taking the meat from everybody else in the very beginning. But Brash, being who he is, the lovable, affable actor-slash-rogue character, he's able to talk his way out of it. He pretends to be a miserable servant of the other three people in our group, who he then describes as master-class assassins. And so these bullies are looking at him just like snivel and be a little wuss, and they kind of like, oh man, we don't want to mess with those guys. We didn't realize that they were actually like hardened killers and now they're you know day one the pit champions so they let brash go and kind of kind of back off you know believing all these four heroes in my party to be their betters but the group is able to rest for the night and the next day we rearm and we get back into the arena again the the whole point is you want to be the pit champion it's the best way to rise to the top and, and kind of set yourself apart from the other slaves so you're not just picked apart in the fights however you are now the sole source of entertainment, or at least the highest headline of it. So when we are thrown back into this pit, this arena, we don't know what to expect. And so from the gates, a pair of lions are unleashed upon us. Now, this fight, they really are not terribly difficult to strike down, but they hit like trucks. So we take a few wounds, it's kind of spread across the entire party, and we're able to survive. But what's most notable about this is that as we are returning to our cells, we see a guard beating that little girl who gave us the warning about magic. Again, we still don't know why we can't use magic here, but there's something about it. And we just can't stand to see this guard hitting this girl. And so we insert ourselves in this situation. We push the guard away, uh, help the little girl up. Unfortunately, you know, this is still essentially a prison slash entertainment place. So a ton of guards come and beat the snot out of us. Everybody takes two wounds and uh, we just have to kind of lay low and pretend to be dead for a little bit. But after we recover and kind of get ourselves together, the little girl that we saved thanks us. And then she says, you know, hey, can you can you guys uh, actually, can you slaves help me? I have to bring some stuff to a darker room. And the guards just kind of let us do our work because they quite frankly don't care. So she leads us down this hallway. And, and as she's going, she kind of whispers to us that there's an escape plan in the works. And so she wanted to say thank you for interjecting and, and kind of saving her life. She leads us down this dark hallway to a tucked away corner with a few other warriors. She, our trainer, is among them. And we learn that this girl, uh, through discussion with Chi, uh, the girl herself, and a few other characters there, as we learn about the world and where we are, because again, we as heroes were just kind of dropped off here, 
we learn quite a bit about the king, that he is a tyrant who usurped power, and that the rightful ruler was actually a person known as the Everchild. Basically, it's a immortal being that reincarnates itself over and over again, constantly. A powerful sorceress that is respectable and noble, but ultimately out of power right now. And we learn that this girl, the one who is an arena slave and being beaten, is this current reincarnation of the Everchild. And again, she has super crazy sorceress powers, uh, memories of past lives, super strong magic, but she's not fully grown yet. She's not like in her full aspect, if you will. But she's the linchpin of like the rallying call of we can bring this kingdom back to what it was before. So she is massively significant. And this group here, kind of tucked away, want to escape and then lead a revolution to see the Iron King laid low and a better government reinstated, restoring the former glory to Salt Dead. Now, at this point, my group, you know, obviously I have some very noble people within my, as my companions, and whether or not they have noble intention, all of us want to get the heck out of here. And so we say, okay, what's the plan, right? I mean, regardless of whether or not we want to help you, we want to get out of here. <laughs> Absolutely. So we ask uh, Chi and the Everchild, what's the plan? And the, the, basically it's twofold. We found an escape tunnel, but we can't go through it without weapons. There are like creatures and spiders and junk like that in there. We just need to arm ourselves, but the weapons are all locked away. So the twofold plan is cause a distraction and snag some weapons from the armory. Now, I say they have an escape tunnel, it's because I, I kind of pointed out in the earlier part that this arena is kind of falling apart in some areas. It's essentially, they use like only a portion of it. There's the slave pen, the arena pit, and things like that. But there's actually, you know, it used to be part of a theater and all these kinds of things. And so there are corridors and hallways that are flooded or basically haven't been touched in years, just totally abandoned. And so we know how to get to those. They found it and kind of dug a little hole into one. So we can get out, but we need to arm ourselves to get there. And so to achieve this task, I split up my team. There's the distraction team and the sneak team. Distraction team is Sir Jessica and Amelia. I had the half-sisters go together because I thought it would be super fun. And their job is to, again, cause a distraction. So the first thing they try to do is kind of whisper among the other slaves and try to foster a bit of a revolt. But they fail, and the guards beat them a bit for even bothering. Okay, so that failed. Okay, okay. So what are we going to do now? Well, then they tried to pretend to be messengers from the guard superiors. But the guards just brush them aside. Like, I know that's not who you are. On the third day, they fake a convincing enough fight to start that riot. Essentially, instead of trying to murmur amongst the slaves to start this revolt, the two of them just start punching each other. And it just creates this fight as they kind of draw others into it and becomes a full riot. In the mayhem that has been created, the sneak team goes in. Brash sneaks into the overseer's office and grabs the key to the armory. We load up on all kinds of goodies and return to our co-conspirators and slip down into this hidden tunnel. Now, this first chamber that we enter into has two passages to it. One goes underwater, the other is dimly lit, but you know, there's, it's definitely traversable. Brash offers to check out the flooded way, but he quickly realizes he has no way of, of knowing how deep this is. He doesn't think he can swim it, and so he and the others go down the other way. After some travel, the team enters into a giant spider's nest, right? A collapsed bridgeway that has been taken over by these giant spiders. Their eggs are all over the bottom, and, and so we have a few choices here. We can try to sneak around the edges... We could walk straight through, but try very carefully to like tiptoe all around the different spider eggs. Or we can just initiate the fight. And quite honestly, uh, getting into a fighting stance and taking them on seems like a much smarter proposition to Akihiro and Sar Jessica than any of the other things. And so basically we initiate the fight. The Everchild splits the sky a little bit. All these giant spiders come down and we get into this huge raucous. Ultimately, the spiders are defeated, the eggs burned, and our little party continues on. That is until we reach a fork in the road, and it is a sign that's nearly eroded. However, it can be read that if we go left, it's to the armory. If we go right, it's to the changing room. Now, we understand that 
you know, this is definitely the abandoned part of the arena, so we don't think that there's anything in these places, but they're just different things that used to exist. My party opted to go towards the armory. Which, you know, thinking, okay, maybe we can get some better gear, we can raid some stuff. But the thing is, the armory is completely empty, except for a single sword that a skeleton has locked in his arms. At this point, the Everchild warns us, you know, it, there has an enchantment, I can sense there's power in it, but I also feel a darkness as well. Now, Brash, uh, being, you know, the charismatic guy that he is, goes, oh, whatever, you know, I... I'm just going to grab this. If it's really a bad thing, I can sell it later. Who cares? Well, the moment he touches it, he suffers a wound. And it becomes evident that the longer he holds this sword, even though it gives him fantastic fighting capability, which it really does, uh, it will ultimately have him end just like the skeleton clutching it here in the depths. So he drops it. He's like, nope, never mind. <laughs> he, he, took, he took the hit just thinking he could be greedy about it, but ultimately leaves it. The tunnelways coming out of the armory eventually lead to a small cove. And essentially, they're looking down at this group of people that they find within this cove. There's a bunch of crates and barrels, all marked with different uh, company names, and it becomes very evident, these are thieves. Now, we have a choice. We can uh, attack, you know, we can kind of surround them and then spring the trap and attack them, wipe at them out and get all their stuff, or... We can announce ourselves, right? We're, they're clearly not on the side of the law, and that's who we're trying to avoid too. So there's some, you know, mutual benefits to uh, just kind of let each other pass by. So I have Brash, you know, our charismatic rogue, announce us. And again, we see that these are thieves, but we learn from chatting with them that they're kind of a Robin Hood style thieves. These companies they're stealing from all pay homage to the Iron King at the top. And so they say, hey, listen, the king's not going to take care of us. Uh, we're going to steal from him, you know, via all these manufacturers that send stuff to him. But we're going to steal from him and we'll distribute it. And after this revelation, you know, they understanding that we are essentially slaves on the run from the king and being pawns in his game and that they are, you know, like I said before, kind of a Robin Hood type character. We're warmly greeted, we're given new clothes, some food, and some water, and shown the exit from the arena. We leave the tunnel network, and now in the open air of Saltstad. The Everchild says that, okay, listen, we need to split up. We look too conspicuous altogether. Again, this is a fairly large group at this point. But before she leaves, she extends an opportunity to join her cause. If we want, we can help and play a part in restoring the Everchild, the sorceress, uh, to the leadership of Staltstad and take down the Iron King. We get the name of an inn where we can find them for uh, you know, being a part of that in the future. And my party, the four of us, are left to explore the city as free people. Although kind of kind of maybe just steer and clear as some of the guards here and there. Now at this point, I just, I'm not going to go into these, but I want to leave here the fact that at this point, a ton of side quests open up to us. We see a girl crying that we can go console and try to help. There's a thieves guild in town that now we have maybe, maybe a little bit of kindred spirits with after our little encounter with the thieves. We could also visit the palace and try to get some actual authority work, even though you wouldn't think that, but the palace guards are different than the arena guards. They wouldn't recognize us. And there's also a few temples and an inn. You may not have picked up on it, and I tried to highlight when I had a choice to make, but this book is an incredible RPG game that can be played solo or with a group, and jam-packed within the story I just told are a million ways that it could have gone very differently. And so what I want to do now is transition back to the camera and talk about the game that I was playing, and I would love for you to try it too. So friends, that story was made possible by a role-playing game that is new as far as I've ever heard. Again, I'm pretty fairly new to the genre, and it's known as Legendary Kingdoms, The Valley of Bones. So Legendary Kingdoms is a series of books. Um, Valley of Bones is the first one in there. And essentially, it's a role-playing game mixed with a choose-your-own-adventure book. These create tabletop role-playing games, pen and paper style with classic artwork that can be played as, you know, as a group. You can have your friends be these characters, or you can play it solo, which is what I did. And actually to prove that I played the entire thing, I'm going to have that running in the bottom here. But it does have the RPG elements of, you know, dramatic character building. Uh, you can increase stats, weapon options, you know, like D&D, &D, they have uh, modifiers to your skills based on the weapons and armor that you're carrying. And so you have cool RPG things like stats, dice rolling, inventory management, that kind of stuff. 
but the choose your own adventure style format is super interesting because when I was first heard, when I first heard about this, I was like, well, how complex could it be? I had some choose your own adventure books when I was a kid. They were not very drastically, you know, incredible. They were like, if you know, you can go left or right. It keeps you pretty much on rails. This one was very different and I wasn't quite expecting it because of two very important factors. The first thing is that the characters you choose, this book gives you six, but I believe there's gonna be more in the, the later books. Uh, the characters you choose dictate special features. So for example, if you're playing, um, let's pick a, pick a video game role playing game. So like uh, Knights of the Old Republic, okay? Um, if you carry certain characters with you in your party, they have unique dialogue options when you go to do, you know, talk to the bad guy or something like that. This book does the exact same thing. Certain members of your party have extra skills and abilities and so it will say, hey, if this dude's in your party, you get something special. An example from my story that you might not have caught is that when Brash was pulled aside by the bullies who were, you know, kind of like dominating the food in the first scene, um, that was a very unique check. It's like, if the person who got pulled aside was Brash, go to blank. And so, that's exactly what I did. He is a smooth talker, and so his unique ability, his contribution to that scenario is being able to talk his way out of it. So character choices matter, and they have real in-game effects and, and things like that to really re-emphasize what their strengths are, and I love that. The second part is consequence. I have never played a choose-your-own-adventure style game that had consequences. And by that, what I mean is when you make decisions, a lot of times in the text, it will say you gain a code, okay? And you just have a little roster in the back. It's very simple to keep track of. Um, and essentially what you're doing is these are the consequences of your actions, but they don't give away anything. You have to keep playing and exploring and working through the world to know what the ramifications are. Now, there is an example of some of these things when it comes to uh, that little demo game that I played that's playing right now. Um, one great one is at the end, Instead of attacking the the thieves, I instead chose to try and greet them. I was like, okay, Brash is like a charisma guy. I'm sure he has met some, you know, underbelly people before. Maybe he can smooth talk again. But because I was kind to them, I gained a code that would allow me later on to go meet some people within a thieves guild. There was also a cause and effect when I defended the young girl versus letting the guard beat her, all these kinds of things. So the decisions that you make in the early part of the game have actual drastic ramifications going on. Depending on who you save, who you leave behind, if you in, you know kind of inject yourself in a situation, uh, if you try to get more information from people, all of these things have ramifications and the code system is how they do it. So yes, even though you're looking at one playthrough, I actually played through this game twice more. Uh, once as a all good character. Um, essentially when I did the playthrough that I'm talking about, the story that I told, I tried to be very reasonable and like what would these specific four characters want and, and do and that kind of stuff. But then I did an all good, absolute pure nobility run. And then I also did a deep evil side run. And the two were very different because you gain the favor of the king or you gain the favor of like this resistance that's going on and um, there's all a bunch of ramifications. You can get more money and weapons with one over the other. It's very cool. But what I like is that there's this big in-between space, right? The the story that I told was the, the true role-playing aspect of what I wanted to do. But the fact is that there's a huge swath of paths that you can take and all of them interact with each other and have consequences. Now here is my little character sheet that I was using to keep track of things in the, the playthrough that you guys just saw. And the four characters I chose, of course, were Brash, Akihiro of Chalice, uh, Sar Jessica Dane, and Amelia Pass Dane. Now, the reason I chose those, specifically, Brash, I just wanted a Han Solo type guy. It's what He seems very roguish, and I kind of like that. Um, Akihiro of Chalice is a gentleman who is a warrior who has this big honor system. So I chose those two first because I was like, I want to see how uh, the story elements could look if I have a good mix of, you know, dogged underdog, you know, um, again, Han Solo rogue type versus someone who's very honorable, you know, and, and, and reveres his word as his bond, that kind of stuff. So I thought that would create some cool narrative tension. Now, the next two down below were Amelia Pass Dane 
who uh, is basically the stepsister, or half-sister, I should say, of Sar Jessica Dane. The two are vaguely related. However, Amelia was taken away when she was young, so they don't know each other very well. And I thought that could be an interesting drama. And then also it kind of mirrors the, the gentlemen that are right there printed above them, where um, Sar Jessica Dane and Akihiro are both warrior-type people with a lot of honor, and Brash and Amelia are more the everyday citizens. Now, as far as an actual review of how the game works and stuff like that, uh, the truth is it's an extremely simple system. There's like six rules, six uh, pages in the beginning. They just kind of walk you through some stuff and then most of that's art and things like that. Uh, it was very easy to use, very intuitive. Uh, felt like I always knew kind of, the story never felt like it was dragging. You know what I mean? If I had to give a mechanical review, the only things that I would do, and this is what I did in my playthrough, so it's just an opinion. Um, when you assign damage to somebody in your party, like if your enemy attacks you, you can give that damage to anybody you want. It doesn't have a specific, uh, the enemies don't have specific targets. It just targets your party. So you guys are able to kind of divvy that up wherever you want. Um, I would probably say something like the same person can't receive damage twice in a row, but you can, you can cycle between two, you know, bruisers. Uh, just because once I get, once I got Sar Jessica Dane the shield, she was able to tank most things. Um, and then I started halfway through the game kind of like doing that alternating rule and it did make it a lot. The tension definitely increased from there. And the other thing I would probably add is that uh, wounds don't spill over. So it's not explicitly said in the rules, but when you know I picked a character and he had to attack a specific enemy, uh, nothing says the wounds don't roll over, but I played it like that because it would get more attacks in and, and things would have to, you know, that gives the enemy more chances to attack back and it raised the stakes quite a bit. And what I will say is that doing that, there was actually a lot of tension. There is permadeath in this game. Like if, if somebody dies, that's it. And so uh, the reason I, I loved it is because my health got down to like two or three out of eight, I think. So it got really brutal, but it was actually super fun. There's plenty of times for you to heal up or take a respite, something like that. Uh, I never felt like I was in danger of losing the role-playing game, uh, but I had an absolute blast. Now, like I said, this is a printed off version of a free PDF that's available for you in the uh, description below to get you a chance to try and taste the system for yourself, see what the world is like, um, and, and kind of allow you to engage with it in a meaningful way. However, I'll be honest with you, the full book is like 20 bucks and you can play it. Uh, so just extrapolating how many hours I got out of this, uh, about 12 hours or so. And uh, it would be, I don't know, man, dollar per hobby time. That's pretty dirt cheap. And the fact that you can play this solo or by, you know, or with your group that you normally do, I thought was really cool. One thing I will suggest if you do want to do this uh, is have a notebook or something next to you and when you when it tells you to go to a, you know a different section or something like that write down the number that you are currently in this way if you have to put it down and pick it back up over multiple sessions which you probably will uh, it's easy to find out where you left off. Now full disclosure the guys over at Spider-Mind Games are pretty much the sponsors for this entire week and this is one of their games. The thing is, uh, I did not contact them for Legendary Kingdoms. I contacted them about another product we'll talk about later, but they showed me this and I was so freaking intrigued by it that I was like, I have to try that. I've never, I mean, it's kind of like, to be honest with you, um, when someone says like an adult, or I guess a mature idea of a choose your own adventure book, it kind of made me think of like the um, the adult coloring books where it's like bad words and that kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. But what I got was actually super cool. It's a very dynamic form of storytelling. And it plays a lot like a video game, if I'm perfectly honest, where um, essentially this is the tutorial series. So it gives it introduces concepts like using codes, um, how to use magic, combat, how to do skill checks, things like that. And then once you leave here, because I do have the full version after this, I'm gonna carry my characters on, uh, that's when the world opens up to you and there's immediately side quests. This tutorial series ends with you being able to pick up a ton of side quests to explore later on when you move on to the full version. So I always make a point to not you know, really promote things unless I try them. I am going to be playing the rest of this and I'd like to know if you want to see me, you know, walk through it kind of like I did with this one with a story mode, um, as well as talk about, you know, the next books in the series. If you don't know, the reason uh, the guys over at Spider-Man asked me to cover this 
is because the second book in this series is going on Kickstarter this week. And the thing is that they're not in chronological order. Like you don't have to play the Valley of Bones to play the one that's on Kickstarter. You could because it's a great way to prime yourself for the system, but essentially imagine Game of Thrones, but each book is a region, not necessarily a chronological narrative. So in this one, I woke up as a slave. I imagine the next one, uh, they'll have some other means of introducing me to the setting like that. But uh, you, your characters and your equipment and stuff can carry on from one adventure to the next, but you're not restarting everything or continuing the same narrative on a, on a setting scale, right? On a character level, you are, but on a setting scale, you're not. So I just wanted to play this game and, and get a sense for it. I had an absolute blast. I'm not, this is not a, a sales pitch. This video is because I wanted to make it because I just genuinely hadn't seen something like this. And uh, some fun facts about it is the artwork, it looked familiar and I was like, I know this artist, but I don't like know many artists. It's the same dude who did uh, Judge Dredd back in the day, Robin. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm terrible at his last name. I always always called him Robin when I was talking about it. But uh, yeah, absolutely incredible work. It looks absolutely cool. It has that real like old pen and paper feel, even though I wasn't playing games back then. Um, I don't know. So I recommend it. Go ahead and check it out. Like I said, it's just a super fun game to play with your friends or family, and I think that you'll enjoy it. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions about it, because like I said, I have played it, I have hands-on experience, leave them in the comments down below and I will be happy to answer them all. So thank you all so much for watching, and happy wargaming.